Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty's uh, webinar on combating criminalization during COVID-19, uh, getting people housed, and keeping them housed. My name is Eric Harris. I'm a senior attorney here at the Law Center, and or legal director now at the Law Center. Um, and we are really thankful for all of you for turning out today. Um, and we will try to respect your time and get through this um, in as quickly as possible. We know everybody is busy doing everything they can. Uh, today, we have um, a, a great presentation for you on, um, which will start with a welcome from our executive director and then proceed with some quick background on COVID-19, go through some of the federal guidance and resources that are out there, and then look at some of the tools that we have created in order to help people advocate for getting people off the streets and out of shelters and into individual housing, which we feel is the best um, and safest place for them to be at this point. Um, and then we'll talk about some of our other resources and upcoming webinars uh, that will be part of the series. Um, and then there will be time for questions and answers at the end. Uh, we've got an all-star panel of presenters today, um, uh, including our senior attorney, Tristia Bauman, and two uh, associates from Pro Bono Partners, Adil Scheich at Fish and Richardson, and Carrie Jeffries from Sullivan and Cromwell, who are helping us prepare some of our resources uh, that we'll talk about later in the presentation. Uh, just as a quick note, um, uh, today's presentation is being recorded uh, and may be posted publicly as a resource. So um, uh, just be aware of that as you're asking questions. If you do have a question to ask, you can use the um, chat box on the side to type in your question. Um, and at the end, we may be able to facilitate uh, oral asking questions, in which case you can raise your hand, but the easiest way is just going to be to, to type it into the chat box. Also, um, uh, if you want to share out any of the materials uh, you hear about today, any um, of the resources, please, and you want to do so on Twitter, please feel free to tag us in that uh, so we can uh, retweet and amplify uh, the messages further. We are at NLCHP Homeless uh, on Twitter. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn things over to Maria Foscarinas, our executive director, for a few quick words of welcome. Maria? Thank you, Eric, and welcome everyone to today's webinar, Combating Criminalization During COVID-19. I'm Maria Foscarinas. I am the executive director and founder of the Law Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all. This is the first in a series that we will be hosting during this critical time. We have over 360 participants registered, and that number includes foundations, pro bono law firms, corporate legal departments, grassroots, local, state, and national advocates, legal aid lawyers, law enforcement, government agencies, um, it, this is a terrific mix, and it is great because we will need a broad coalition of partners to get through the current crisis, and most critically, work to get to a better place beyond the crisis. Homelessness was already a crisis in our country. When the pandemic hit, it created a new crisis on top of the existing one. People who are homeless are especially vulnerable. They have more health problems. They are more likely to suffer from asthma and other respiratory illnesses, hypertension, and diabetes. People who are homeless suffer from poor nutrition, less sleep, more anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues. As with the general population, these pre-existing conditions put them at higher risk of contracting COVID-19. And so, of course, does homelessness itself. Complying with stay-at-home orders is simply not possible when you have no home. Social distancing is not possible when you're living in a shelter, sleeping in a cot or on a mat, 
on the floor with dozens or hundreds of others. Frequent hand washing or basic sanitation is challenging if you are living on the street with no access to a restroom. People who are homeless are unable to take the basic precautions we are all being urged or required to take. Those who become infected are twice as likely to be hospitalized, two to four times as likely to require critical care, and two to three times as likely to die from the illness as the general population. Like homelessness itself, these grievous harms do not fall equally. People who are homeless are disproportionately people of color, as are people who contract, fall ill, and die from COVID-19. This crisis has made clearer than ever that homelessness in America is a human rights crisis. Housing is essential to end it. It is essential to health for those who are homeless and for all of us. It's now clearer than ever that health is not possible without housing, not for people without it and not for anyone. Housing is a basic human right. We must ensure it for everyone to protect homeless people and our entire community. The National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty is the only national organization dedicated solely to using the power of the law to end and prevent homelessness. Our vision is for a world where housing is a right enjoyed by all, not a privilege held by some. In partnership with our network of grassroots and other advocates, pro bono support from law firms, we use the law as a powerful tool for systemic change that positively affects hundreds of thousands of people. So when the pandemic hit, we knew we had to respond with immediate action to protect people, save lives, and prevent more harm. Collectively, we've had some successes with much more to be done. And we have developed and continue to develop tools to implement new practices, uh, new strategies and emerging best practices. So we'll be using these webinars as well as our new coronavirus page on our website, which we regularly update to make those tools and strategies available. Please use them. Please give us feedback when you do. We want to hear about the impact um, and how we can make them better and on um, any emerging new issues we see. Thank you again, and I am happy to now turn this over to our first speaker. Thanks so much, Maria. Uh, and that first speaker is me. Um, so I will continue with a little bit more background. Um, I will go through some of this quickly as Maria has already previewed uh, some of it. Um, uh, we have, uh, uh, sorry here. Need to uh, redo. Here we go. Um, so we uh, have, um, as Maria was saying, uh, we know that people experiencing homelessness are at increased risk of contracting uh, COVID-19 um, because of pre-existing health conditions. They are also more likely to be hospitalized, require intensive care, and more likely to die than the general population. And this is important um, because it really emphasizes that as a public health issue, uh, it's important to get people into housing, into indiv individual housing units and make them as safe as they can possibly be because this is an issue that impacts all of us. If uh, people experiencing homelessness are getting uh, sick and requiring hospitalization at increased rates. Those are hospital beds and uh, ventilators and other uh, items in critical shortage that aren't going to be available when others in the community need them also. So it's not just about the health and safety of the people on the streets themselves. Uh, it's about uh, the entire community's ability to weather the storm as best possible. Uh, despite this, we know that uh, in a number of communities, uh, camping bans on camping and sleeping on the streets are still being enforced. People are still being shuffled around, forced to move under 
penalty of law um, and uh, mixing, you know, their uh, whatever uh, exposures they've had with uh, being forced to mix them with other populations or being put into jail into a congregate setting um, where, you know, which is uh, another huge concern um, where they could potentially become infected or in fact, the other uh, uh, people in the jail, including staff as well as other prisoners. Uh, we also know that uh, seemingly neutral laws uh, around uh, parking in public spaces, uh, not parking overnight, not sleeping in your vehicle, um, have been on the increase over the um, past decade and that these laws are also still being implemented in many communities. Uh, and when people uh, often lose their vehicles, face impoundment as a result of the enforcement of these laws, they lose their shelter, they lose their ability to shelter in place, as it were, and, um, and are more exposed and more likely uh, to get sick themselves and uh, to infect others. Uh, also, because all of these issues, homelessness and uh, different health conditions um, are have a disparate racial impact. We know that racial equity is an important aspect that we need to address as we uh, go through this crisis. We know that be, even before the crisis, um, that uh, people uh, of color were more likely uh, to be severely rent burdened, uh, to be paying more than 50% of their income every month uh, in terms of rent, uh, and then, and that they are also more likely to be in jobs uh, that are being hardest hit by the COVID-19 closures, and therefore uh, most likely to be uh, highly vulnerable to losing their homes uh, in the midst of this crisis or after and we need to be building in solutions that will address that. Uh, and as uh, Maria was saying, we know that uh, many of these communities uh, are also, because of pre-existing health inequities, um, they are more vulnerable to being more sick and um, less likely to receive care than other populations. And all of these are issues that need to be addressed uh, in an equitable manner uh, in order to have the best outcome for uh, all of us for the crisis. Uh, last but not least, uh, in addition to being an issue of housing policy and of racial justice, we know this is also a human rights issue uh, and we'd be remiss if we didn't uh, reference some of the fantastic reports and statements that have come out from the international level from the UN uh, Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing on um, a number of issues around COVID-19 uh, and evictions um, and uh, affecting people living in homelessness and those living in informal settlements and encampments. Uh, I definitely recommend folks going to the link on the screen and uh, checking out these resources. They have some really fantastic language that uh, can be used as part of advocacy strategies. Uh, with that, we'll turn now to some of the federal guidance and resources that have come out recently um, and uh, can be used by advocates as part of their advocacy. Um, early on in the crisis, we realized very quickly that um, communities might be likely to use uh, the opportunity of the, uh, the crisis to uh, sweep homeless populations. Um, and that that would be very dangerous. So we advocated quickly and were able to get guidance from the Centers for Disease Control, stating very clearly that unless individual housing units like hotel rooms are available, that communities should not be clearing encampments uh, during the spread of COVID-19, um, that at a minimum, they could encourage spacing of the tents and make sure that uh, there's nearby facilities uh, to uh, be able to wash people's hands. Um, and if there aren't facilities there that they should be providing them. Uh, but that's, you know, that's the minimum that should be done. And clearly the ideal that should be done is to be getting people 
into uh, hotel rooms. Uh, additionally, uh, just today, the uh, Centers for Disease Control updated its guidance for sheltered populations. Um, this has a couple of key provisions. Uh, first, that shelters should not close, nor that should they exclude people who show symptoms or test positive uh, without having a plan for where those clients can safely access services and stay. Uh, we have seen people being turned away from shelters, and this should not be happening. People need to be given a place where they can safely shelter and recover um, as they, you know, as they uh, need to uh, for as long as, as they require such care. Um, the guidance also emphasizes that if there are resources and staff available, that uh, non-group housing options like hotels and motels uh, should be considered uh, in order to help people safely distance themselves uh, in, um, in the shelter situation. Um, and uh, equally as importantly as these immediate steps that as communities are looking at things, they need to be planning for how to connect clients to housing after the, the temporary crisis has passed. Our goal is really that no person who uh, is in any of these facilities should be returned to the streets afterwards. If they are, then that is a, a failure on the part of society to really um, understand the lessons of this, uh, this crisis, that we are all in it together and that, we, um, that housing is a public health uh, approach. Housing, making sure everybody has housing is the, the right prescription uh, for the best public health outcomes. In addition to the CDC guidance, we also have guidance from the Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, that similarly uh, emphasizes that the best practice approach is putting everybody into private individual rooms, um, including those who are, are asymptomatic um, or who have not yet um, been tested, um, although they do indicate better approaches are individual rooms and semi-private spaces. Uh, and they, they at least in this guidance uh, that came out several weeks ago, um, still accepted that shared spaces were a good approach if certain precautions are taken. Um, again, given what we've been seeing over the past few weeks as congregates uh, shelter spaces uh, in San Francisco and Dallas and Boston, um, Seattle have all uh, seen dramatic explosions of uh, of infections uh, in them. Uh, we feel that the the best place for everybody, even those who haven't shown symptoms yet, uh, because we don't know who is asymptomatic but still highly contagious, is to get everybody into hotel rooms as soon as possible. Luckily, with the CARES Act, uh, the um, uh, the funds to be able to help communities do so exist. Um, there was $4 billion in emergency services grants funding, $5 billion in community development block grants, and $150 billion in general relief funds uh, made available to uh, cities and states. And all of those are eligible funding streams that can be used to put people into housing. Um, most of these uh, programs have have a, lot, a large number of their restrictions and caps waived. Uh, none of them require any procurement processes or bidding. Um, and uh, all COVID costs back to the beginning of the crisis are reimbursable. So even if the actual check hasn't arrived from the federal government to the state or the municipality, they can start spending the funds immediately and get them reimbursed later. Uh, so there's really no excuse uh, on the funding side why any community should be hesitating uh, to execute the, you know, this uh, public safety measure of getting people into individual housing units. Um, the other important thing to note is that uh, though under the, the CARES Act, any funds received from it 
um, need to be generally available, that prerequisites can't be put on people experiencing homelessness in order to get into any housing or services made available under the Act. So um, the, the idea is to get people into housing as quickly as possible without having to go through any programming um, to become you know, eligible for that level of housing uh, beforehand. Um, and with this, we have developed a number of tools to help people uh, with their um, uh, with their advocacy. And that I will get us to momentarily. Um, so uh, this is our main um, coronavirus page, a web page on our uh, site, nlchp.org uh, slash coronavirus. And there's a couple of key tools that we have here. Um, first are our uh, tools for taking action. Um, we have created a template press release and a template letter for people to be able to send um, some of these recommendations to their elected officials uh, and get out into the, the public awareness uh, that these recommendations exist, that communities should be stopping their practices of sweeps and criminalizing homelessness and should be putting people uh, into individual uh, housing units. Um, we have uh, a number of best practices um that we've collected from the, the federal the state and the local level um and a full tracker that we'll talk a little bit more about in a bit um where the um we are tracking responses across all different states and cities and counties um and uh with uh breaking it down by the type of practice it is and descriptions and links to the sources, uh, getting the policy language where available. So this is a fantastic resource uh, to be finding out what is going on all across the country and encouraging your community to develop um, best practices uh, and to follow best practices uh, from elsewhere. And we also have additional resources um, that uh, on topics of criminalization, how different housing and different alternatives, uh, racial equity, youth and education that um, this video will talk about in a little bit. Um, we additionally, have, um, have just put out earlier this week, uh, with True Colors United, a uh, a Know Your Rights fact sheets uh, to help uh, homeless youth, LGBTQ youth, uh, get access to uh, shelters um, and uh, be able to assert their right to enter, uh, regardless of their uh, gender identity um, uh, or sexual orientation. And that's available on the, that page as well. Uh, we have a number of recommendations uh, that we've put out and we're encouraging uh, communities to echo uh, stopping the sweeps and not forcing people into congregate shelter facilities, instead getting them into individual housing, um, making sure they have access at a minimum to hygiene and sanitation services, um, stopping all other forms of criminalization, particularly for people living in vehicles, and uh, using surplus governmental property um, to help facilitate safe camping or uh, for housing after the fact, after the pandemic ends, um, making sure that we don't create new homelessness uh, by immediately halting all eviction and foreclosure proceedings um, and making sure that people uh, are being adequately uh, protected after uh, through rental assistance. Um, halting the termination of utility services. Obviously, you can't wash your hands if your water gets cut off um, and making sure 
that all the frontline workers have the resources and protective gear that they need. Um, as I mentioned, this is uh, the, uh, a picture of the template letter that we have. Um, folks can upload, download the letter and put in their own logo, um, put in their own local facts about what's going on in your community, and then um, be able to send it uh, to your elected officials with a lot of the um, language regarding what the federal practices are regarding the, what the law is um, to help encourage uh, your community to act as quickly as possible. We have started seeing some victories uh, from advocacy campaigns uh, based around the CDC guidance. Connecticut and uh, California have both at the state level started uh, expansive programs to start moving people into uh, individual housing units into hotels rather than congregate shelters. Um, there's definitely much more that can be done, much more that needs to be done, and we can't let up the pressure on, uh, on any state government or any local government until everybody is safely individually housed. Um, but uh, it, this is a definite demonstration that our advocacy is being effective. Um, with that, I'm going to turn over to Adil Sheikh uh, to speak briefly a little bit about um, how uh, communities, uh, some some of the resources that uh, Fish and Richardson will be providing uh, to help communities follow up on these letters. Sheikh or Adil, uh, Adil, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi everyone, my name is Adil Sheikh. As Eric mentioned, I'm at Fish and Richardson over in the Dallas office. So we have uh, teamed up with the Law Center to provide some follow-up support to organizations that have submitted demands using the Law Center's template letter. Right now, we have a team of three attorneys here at Fish and Richardson across a few different of, of our offices, uh, helping the Law Center in a variety of, of ways. So for example, we, assist, we can assist by help prepare some of these policy drafts or provide some additional examples. Additionally, we can help prepare you with, for meetings with government officials and lawmakers, or depending on the requirements, even attend those meetings for you. The exact nature of this work will really depend on your community's needs, and we will work in partnership with the Law Center to assist you in the best way that we can. Um, and that's really it. I'm, I'm going to shoot it back to Eric, and he can discuss maybe some of these examples of, of what, what's been going on and continue on with some other information for you. Great, thank you so much, Adil, and uh, thank you so much to Fish and Richardson uh, for stepping up. They really didn't hesitate in this moment of crisis uh, to make their services available. And it, uh, you know, we are so grateful. This is how we work at the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. We serve as the hub, um, but we connect people to the entire resources of the the national legal uh, uh, community. Uh, in order to be able to end and prevent homelessness in America. And so this is a fantastic uh, connection that we are happy to make for people. Um, please go to our website, click on the links, um, get in contact with us uh, in order to be able to take advantage of this great service and get people into housing in your community. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Tristia Bauman uh, to share some additional tools from our websites. Justia. Hello, folks. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and also, thank you very much, Adil. I just want to uh, note that in addition to this project that uh, uh, that the Law Center is doing with Fish and Richardson. Fish and Richardson has been a fantastic partner in other criminalization work that the Law Center is doing. Uh, they have uh, been monitoring uh, proposed criminalization policies and helping us to draft letters to oppose those policies um, when uh, they are under consideration by local governments. They also are co-counsel on a case that the Law Center is doing uh, along with Disability Rights California, Disability Rights Advocates, uh, the Dreyer Law Firm, uh, and others in uh, the San Diego area challenging restrictions on uh, living in vehicles in the city of San Diego. We're really grateful for their support. If you reach out to either Rajan Ball, who you know as the Housing Not Handcuffs campaign manager, or uh, to reach out to me, Tristia Bauman, senior attorney here at the Law Center. Uh, we can connect with um, 
uh, with this particular fish team, Adil and others, to uh, work on follow-up um, to the letters so that we can ensure that that advocacy is successful. I am now going to try to share my screen. And Eric, was that successful? I just stopped sharing. You go ahead and try and share yours again. Okay. I'm going to try to go back to, and I apologize for the technical difficulties here. Eric, if it's okay, I'd like to just uh, let, if you can keep sharing, because it's not, well, it looks like I've got a pop-up here. I'm going to try to, one more time, show my screen so that I can walk you through other parts of the website. Uh, are you seeing my screen now? Yeah, it's working. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so uh, previously Eric mentioned uh, what we're calling the COVID-19 response tracker. When you go to our website, you'll see that there are a number of tabs. If you click on these, that will take you you know, directly to the section of the page that's most relevant. So if you click on best practices, we have a couple of them mentioned here um, that uh, if you click on the level of government, um, a few examples will break down. I'll just call out a couple. Um, as Eric mentioned, Connecticut was the first state to issue an executive order uh, requiring uh, that uh, non-congregate housing options be made available for people experiencing homelessness. We have a, a copy of that order. You can link to that here. You also can see under, if you go down to the local, um, we're tracking not only what local governments are doing, but also what private entities in local govern um, in local jurisdictions are doing. For example, in uh, Frederick, Maryland, the YMCA of Frederick County has utilized a uh, YMCA summer camp to uh, individually house families in a non-congregate setting. Um, we're, we see a number of those types of examples of creative use of uh, that type of uh, temporary housing space. We want to encourage that. Uh, we also uh, are tracking in the uh, COVID-19 response tracker the uh, moratoriums on enforcement of criminalization policies, one of the examples that we've listed here, and these will rotate out um, regularly as we get additional data. Uh, the City of Seattle has suspended enf enforcement of certain parking regulations. Um, for example, um, a common type of ordinance restricting uh, sheltering in vehicles takes the form of a 72-hour parking limitation. You're not allowed to be in place for longer than 72 hours. Uh, that type of enforcement has been temporarily suspended. Um, and um, most critically, uh, there's been a limitation on towing and impoundment of vehicles, um, which is obviously very helpful um, to people who shelter in vehicles um, and uh, allows them to maintain that um, that private shelter option, uh, which for many people, um, in fact, the fastest growing segment of the unhoused population is the uh, best available shelter option for them. Um, in the COVID-19 response tracker, uh, we have uh, a firm, Sullivan and Cromwell, working on putting this resource together for us. They're doing that both by collecting information that we receive from all of you and other Housing Not Handcuffs campaign members. Uh, please do send that information in if your government is doing anything that is good or at least approaching good. We want to know about it. We want to include it in our uh, responses tracker. We also have Sullivan and Cromwell doing a media scrape um, with certain search terms so that we can stay up to speed on the latest news reports about uh, uh, constructive responses to COVID-19. Um, now, uh, we know that the media um, does not always get all the details right. Uh, we know that there's a lot of value, though, in having as much of this information as possible out to you as quickly as possible. So right now we are inclusive of really everything that we're seeing. It's listed in the COVID tracker, uh, and um, it should not be read to be an endorsement of everything that's listed there. Um, you know, they all are reflective of varying degrees of of positive steps toward. Um, the right to housing, uh, but we do think that that information is very valuable. 
and here to tell you a little bit more about the tracker and that process is Carrie Jeffries of Sullivan and Cromwell. Carrie, take it away. Thanks, Tricia. I'm Carrie Jeffries, an associate with Sullivan and Cromwell, and I will note that Sullivan and Cromwell has partnered with the Law Center on a number of meaningful projects in the past, and it is always important and rewarding work. So we are very happy to be asked to assist with the COVID-19 response tracker. Our goal with the tracker is to identify and track practices and policies regarding people experiencing homelessness that are being implemented in response to COVID-19 and in response to the CDC guidance and to capture them in real time as things develop. We are tracking a variety of different policy responses some of the practices we are tracking are ones that have impact on people experiencing homelessness, even if they are not exclusively or explicitly aimed at that community. So we are tracking public responses at a city, county, and state level, public, private, and public-private responses, um, and working to identify any pro private programs or funding or support. So on the tracker that Eric previewed and Tricia has now, you can sort by level, city, county, state, by whether the program is public, public, private, or private, the category of practice, and you'll find descriptions and links to news coverage or policy sources where available. As I mentioned, you can sort also by the categories of practice, which I will talk a little bit more about today. The categories of or types of responses we are focusing on, more than a dozen different types, fall into several broad buckets. So the first and perhaps most essential or important bucket is housing. So that is the provision of individual housing units, which includes provision of hotel and motel rooms, trailers, apartments, dorm rooms, and the like. We are tracking housing provision in the form of group housing or mass shelter, an example of this includes recreation centers being converted into shelters. And then we have what we are loosely calling alternative housing, policies or programs established in places where people can stay in tents, i.e. sanctioned encampments, or in vehicles, i.e. safe parking lots. And on the housing front, we're also tracking new public or private funding for housing and services, including some grants that have been awarded under the CARES Act. Next, we are tracking moratoria on enforcement efforts. This includes moratoria on sweep or displacement of homeless encampments, moratoria on criminalization of homelessness or enforcement of laws punishing homelessness, which also includes general moratoria on arrests, warrant checks and the like, as well as exemptions from stay at home orders and moratoria on parking regulations, such as ticketing, towing and impounding vehicles. We are also tracking judicial or legal policies and incarceration relief. This is in a variety of forms, including release of incarcerated people from jails, which may include release of people pre-trial, zero dollar or low bonds, or early release from a sentence, as well as cancellation of judicial hearings or court appearances. Relatedly, we are tracking policies and programs putting people who are released from jails and hospitals into housing such as respite centers. And then the fourth broad umbrella of categories is services and support for people experiencing homelessness. So these categories include establishment of hygiene and sanitation services, things like hand washing stations, which have been installed at safe parking lots or near encampments, public and private shower facilities, gray water disposal sites, food provision, access to transportation, access to medical services, and funding, both private and public, for these services and support. Finally, we are also tracking proposed or enacted policies guaranteeing certain rights to unhoused people, such as the right to housing or the right to clean water, what may sometimes be called a, a homeless bill of rights. So a lot of the policies are being pulled together and implemented quickly, and as Tristia mentioned, we're trying to capture these as much in real time as possible. We're certainly happy to provide more detail about the tracker, or trends in the coming weeks and perhaps on future webinars. For now, though, I will note a few of the larger trends that we're seeing. Cities certainly seem to be taking the lead on policies. Most of what we've identified thus far is on a local city or sometimes county level, along with local area nonprofits and partners. 
Um, of course, as will come as no surprise, programs are not evenly distributed across the country and even certain cities that may have many COVID-19 cases appear to be reacting slower than, than would be optimal. And we've also been seeing a lot of private public collaboration. So deals with hotel chains for housing, sponsorship of sanitation stations, opening up private gyms or YMCA shower facilities, private sponsored distribution of hygiene or medical supplies and the like. There are a lot of programs so far aimed at providing individual housing units, which is the goal, um, like Project Room Key in California. The caveat is that these programs differ wildly in, in scope and eligibility. We've also lately been seeing a trend of ramping up testing and localities sending teams out into the community to provide testing and supplies and information for people in encampments and at shelters. Finally, I will note that we are certainly cognizant that policies on paper may not have the impact needed or be implemented effectively. And we aim to expand the work with any notes or observations about what is really happening on the ground. We are honored to be helping with this work and believe this will be a great resource. So thanks very much to the Law Center and I will turn it back to Tricia. Thank you very much, Carrie. We really appreciate that. I'll also note that uh, Sullivan and Cromwell um, has been a, a great partner also in other criminalization work that we've done, including helping to put together the prohibited conduct chart, which is the survey of laws on the books in 187 cities across the country that serves as the basis for the data that Eric went over with you earlier today. And that is reflected in our Housing Not Handcuffs 2019 report, um, which is also available on our website and linked uh, here on the coronavirus uh, specific web page. I'm just going to go very quickly over some additional resources that you can find on this web page in addition to the ones that the Law Center has produced um, that have already been discussed. We have different tabs here. If you click on them, you'll find uh, both uh, resources that we've produced and ones uh, produced by partner organizations. I'll just call out a few. Uh, I mentioned the criminalization report. That is very helpful. There's a section on why criminalizing homelessness undermines public health. A lot of great source material there. I absolutely do recommend um, that you check out that report in that specific section. In addition, we have uh, information in our Housing and Alternatives tab about CARES Act. For example, um, there's a handy, uh, let's, it's a little bit long to call it a one-pager or a fact sheet, but a summary uh, document that walks through different sections of the CARES Act, gives you the precise language and citations, um, which can be very helpful as well. Uh, Eric mentioned that we have a racial equity fact sheet that's gonna be coming out very soon, probably later this week. You're gonna find it here um, under the racial equity tab. Please do be on the lookout for that. If you click on youth and education and you scroll down, you can find the uh, fact sheet that was just produced and released yesterday by the Law Center um, along with True Colors Fund. Um, and that document uh, was discussed a little bit earlier today and that uh, and is available on the Youth and Education tab. For some reason, I am having a hard time scrolling over, so I'll just move my screen here. And if you go under additional resources, you can find resources that the Law Center, of, of Law Center partners, um, some of which we have contributed to. And let me try to get my screen back over. such that you can see what I am talking about here. Um, darn it, I'm, this is my first time screen sharing. I think it's probably pretty evident that that is the case and I apologize for not having this more readily viewable. Um, but suffice it to say on this, uh, on this section, we've got uh, resources from various other partners. One is from the eviction lab um, at Princeton University. We contributed to um, the uh, breakdown by states of um, eviction moratoria and other renters' rights protections. You'll note that there really isn't much of that that's captured in the Law Center's COVID-19 response tracker. That's because Emily Benfer um, at Columbia Law and uh, the folks over at Eviction Lab at Princeton have been doing a great job of collecting that um, information. 
we have uh, consulted on what is now available as a state-by-state uh, -state, um, uh, scorecard and you can get information about both the methodology for your state score and uh, the local information including local policies all on uh, that resource which um, are available on this other resources tab and it'll be apparent when you can see a normal screen. Um, one additional resource that I'd like to call out, Community Solutions has created a wiki. Um, you know Community Solutions from 100,000 Homes campaign and now Built for Zero. Uh, they're a nonprofit that has um, a lot of reach into continuums of care and they work with groups to uh, help uh, communities streamline their existing systems and resources to create efficiencies um, and to um, try to maximize uh, resource use. What you'll see on this particular uh, wiki is information being posted by um, by various contributors. Um, and over on the left-hand side, and ah, I wish I could show it to you, but it's all broken down by category. For example, there's a, a tab for encampments where people can post and you can read what other people's have, uh, people have posted for more information. Um, in addition to uh, renters' rights and other tabs, you can go right to the resource that's most helpful for you. Um, we are going to be doing future webinars, um, so do stay on the lookout for that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and you can take that back over, Eric. You're far more competent at, at that than I am. Um, I will say that our future webinars um, are going to uh, cover a variety of topics. Two weeks from today, at this same time, we are going to discuss uh, constitutional challenges to criminalization policies um, in the uh, wake of COVID-19 um, outbreak and also uh, constitutional arguments that can be made uh, to get people into housing. Um, that particular webinar will have a focus on substantive due process arguments, in particular state-created danger arguments, um, but we'll also talk, uh, talk about cruel and unusual punishment arguments under the Eighth Amendment um, as well. So be on the lookout for that. Please mark your calendars. That's two weeks from today at the same time where you can come in and learn uh, about uh, all of the great research that we've done. We have circuit by circuit research on um, these different theories and uh, you can learn how to wield those tools. You've got my contact information before you and I'll turn it back to Eric for the remaining time so we can do um, final housekeeping and Q&A. Great, thank you so much, Justia. Um... Uh, so quickly, just wanted to get a sense of um, uh, how useful this <laughs> has been for people. Um, so uh, we're going to launch a little poll here um, with the question being, uh, will you use what you've learned today in your work uh, during the COVID-19 crisis and beyond? I'll give you about 10 more seconds to click on the links. And this is useful for, for us to know if we're, we're doing what the field needs. And obviously, if we aren't, uh, feel free to follow up afterwards and tell us what we can be doing better. All right, so uh, with that, I will close this out here. And um, it looks like, uh, uh, most people are, yes, definitely going to be using these resources, so that's a good guide for us. And at least we have zero at no, probably not. So that's that's good that we are on the wrong track. Um, so thank you, folks, for that. Um, additionally, uh, as another step that uh, you can take, if you haven't already, please endorse our National Housing Not Handcuffs campaign by going to housingnothandcuffs.org. Um, once you endorse the campaign, uh, either individually or organizationally, you'll be joining uh, more than a thousand other endorsers all across the country. Um, we have a listserv where people are sharing resources, um, questions, uh, and other things as they come up with them. Um, we have a whole bunch of other resources, talking points, and sample legislation uh, that folks can use to um, 
to advocate for uh, housing and against criminalization of homelessness in their communities. Um, so please, uh, as I said, uh, go right after this uh, and um, sign up if you haven't already endorsed. Um, uh, last but not least, um, we are doing this work. Uh, we don't have any specific grants to do it at this point. Um, and uh, we are devoting pretty much all of our resources, both <laughs> Christy and I, I know, have been working uh, much more than the standard eight hour work day um, every day of the week and often on the weekends um, in order to get this done. And so uh, no matter how large or small um, a donation uh, to the Law Center to help support this work and keep it coming, keep these resources coming to you, keep uh, our voice being able to coordinate the voices of other legal, others in the legal field um, and bring those resources to the people who need them. Um, this is the work that we do and we could use your support. So with that, um, if anybody has any questions, uh, happy to uh, take them now. Um, you can either type them in the chat box and um, uh, or try to raise your hand. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. We've had a, um, a question about, it, will there be a sources page or version of this presentation that has the citations for the statistics? Um, and uh, that's uh, most of the citations and the statistics um, have uh, either, are either, or, well, they're all in some of the resources that are listed on the website. Um, so either our Housing on Handcuffs 2019 report, um, or some of the other uh, reports uh, on the website, the, the materials about um, the statistics about the vulnerability of people experiencing homelessness to COVID-19 are from uh, the uh, study done by um, Dennis Colhane and others um, that came out a few weeks ago. That's linked um, on the website and the racial equity statistics. Uh, those will all have links in the fact sheet that should be coming out uh, in the next day or two and will be posted under the racial equity section of the website. Um, uh, there's a question about whether the guidelines say whether or not people can be turned away from a shelter if there's no capacity and if there's still not an alternative place to send them. Um, uh, they, uh, they say that people should not be turned away. Um, unless there's another place to put them. And so communities, if this is happening, need to be uh, developing strategies and planning um, for how they are going to accommodate those needs. And obviously the, the best thing that can be done is to be getting people into individual housing units. Um, seems like some people uh, were having trouble with the audio, which is unfortunate. Um, uh, there's a request for uh, being able to download the webinar. We should have the um, uh, the webinar posted up to the COVID-19 page on our website uh, later this week, and uh, we will be sending out an email with that with the link once it's up, and we will make the slides available as well. So people, um, you'll be getting an email. The the email will hopefully contain the registration link for next our next webinar as well, um, and we'll be able to uh, to continue along in the series, but everything, all the resources will be posted onto the website. Um, and that is all I'm seeing now for uh, questions. If anybody has any additional ones, um, please let us know. And if not, um, then uh, I'm going to thank our other presenters. Um, Tristia, I don't know if you have any last words you want to include before we uh, close out. I just want to thank everyone. Please do keep sending in any information about your community's response to COVID-19 uh, and uh, check our coronavirus webpage uh, periodically as we will be updating it in as close to real time as possible. 
Um, if you are submitting our letters, um, then please do reach out. Or if you have other letters that um, ask for the same core demands and you need assistance with follow-up, again, please do reach out Raj and Ball, our ball at nlchp.org or uh, T. Bauman at nlchp.org. Um, and of course, Eric is available as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, and uh, we'll see you again in two weeks.